Good morning, everyone. I see we already have some people uh, viewing. Uh, if you take a moment and uh, go to and turn on your ability to see the questions area, there's a little question mark at the top of the screen, top right. And then also once you get that question area opened up, if you could uh, change the anonymous and, and just type your name in. So that way if you ask any questions, we know where the questions are coming from. Thank you and uh, we'll start in a little bit. Good morning, everyone. We're still going to wait a little bit before we start, but if you do take a moment to find your uh, the question mark at the top right of the screen, uh, you can open your questions area. And if you do have a chance to ask, you know, if you desire to ask a question, we ask that you at the lower of that screen actually enter your name in the uh, lower right section where it says anonymous. That would be great to help us uh, answer your questions later. Thank you for joining us and just give us a couple minutes and we'll start. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us this, this afternoon, this morning. My name's Brian Such and with Marabeni Citizen. And uh, as these times are tough and we're all trying to figure out how we reach out to our customers and just keep in contact, uh, we came up with uh, two weeks worth of web events just to keep everybody informed. Um, before we start this event, and I turn it over to the current presenter, we would like to uh, inform you one more time that you can ask questions via the questions and answers area. Uh, there's a little question mark at the top of the screen. And once you open up your questions area, you can, uh, if you would, there's an area that says anonymous and um, uh, if you could put your name in, it would help us just uh, know who's asking the questions for later. So uh, as we start today, we have uh, mainly one presenter and a second presenter to help out where needed. Uh, Mike Wantanabe will be presenting our MCC tooling and accessories uh, review. And then also along with uh, some of our automation projects that we've come up with. Uh, in the automation section, uh, Dave Doobie will join a little bit, and he is electrical design department manager for uh, MCC automation. So with this, I would like to turn it over to Mike Wantanabe, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. I'm Mike Watanabe, uh, Marubeni Citizen Shinkon. Vice President of R&D. I'd like to introduce some of our products. I have three items, uh, MCC R&D, who we are, second thing and accessories. Third one, automation. MCC R&D, research and development, Located in Agawam, Massachusetts, we are MCC's research and develop team specializing in tooling and accessories and automation for citizen Cinco Miano machines. We have three departments, mechanical design department, electrical design department, research department. We are listening to our request from our customers of them making a specialized customized options. Also, we are planning and thinking, considering future products. I have uh, David Duby, Electrical Data Design Department. Uh, he will manage, uh, he will join, uh, jump in to explain some uh, interesting options later. Tooling and accessories. I have uh, nine items. Uh, let me explain uh, one by one. B axis. Citizen developed B axis features for L20, L32, Type 12. This gives many of machine machining process. Angular drilling, milling, or the threading, even four axis simultaneous milling. Machine has regular V axis spindle. Four from four back, all built in ER11 collet. It's already very nice. However, we added some flexibility. We developed three modular holder on the B axis for two models. This gives modular flexibility. You can install ER16 spindle, 80,000 high speed spindles, double cross spindle with ER11, two stationary block or triple face from the back, thread wiring. Video is showing four times speeder gear driven for top and the bottom. Middle uh, position 
we have ER16 here, then uh, customer can choose uh, any ma many spin doors choices depending on the application. Recently, we developed ATC automatic tool changer for L20 type 12. We showed this option for IMTS 2018. Some of, here is some policy of development. High end of BRC's modular tooling system, compact and integrated with machine, field retrofitable. Please make sure the machine should have the latest design. Simply ask, is my L220 Type 12 ATC ready or not? Then your local sales staff can answer. Please have serial number to verify. This is showing uh, ATC spindle layout. Again, we had a, we swap uh, from a regular BRC spindle to ATC spindle. Actually, two stations. Upper station is T11, ER16 collet. It's built in. Lower station is for ATC. Total 12 tools available. This means you can have 13 live tools on the axis. Spindle speed 12,000. Maximum tool OD and length is 30 millimeter. You still have two cross, regular two cross ER16 live tool. That's 9,000 RPM. Again, uh, we have 12 tools available for ATC. We have a very compact carousel cell type style magazine with two NC axes. A5 is a linear, A6 for the index. We utilize existing NC axis to, for tool change using X and Y. Here is a comparison between regular B axis spindle and the ATC spindles. This is footprint after installed ATC. Just small area is extended from a regular L212 type 12. This is required for Magazine A5 axis back and forth, just small extension. Please make sure tool holder is not included with ATC option kit. But here is the information you can contact on the, on the purchase directory. At this moment, one supplier is available, Yukiwa Seiko USA. Here is the information, part number. We are working a second or third suppliers and hopefully we will update next month. This is an example of ATC application using a total 11 to live tool by ATC. Mike, we do have a question. Uh, yes. Is it possible to, if you have the ATC machine, yes. is it possible to put the old tool holder back in for a specific job and not use the ATC and then go back to ATC again? Oh, okay. So, actually, as I said, it's a little refitable. The regular 12 type, L20 type 12 has still have 
on regular BRCs, then yes, you can switch uh, between regular to ATC as you as needed. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So you can add uh, more questions and in time. So we will have uh, time to answer after the pre presentation again. I keep on I'm moving. <clears throat> Next one is red wiring. Very, very popular for medical. Um, bone screws are complex threaded components, usually requiring numerous hours of process development set up debugging a cycle time. Threat wearing is the most efficient means to produce difficult OD threats by providing a solution that minimizes development to production time with faster cycles. The so flexibility of threat wearing enables to cost reductions with setup simplification, faster cycle, and a greater throughput. You know well, but, uh, but we actually developed and designed four type of thread wiring head to fit with most of all single models. BTW2000 is the most common used for many models. Helix angle 25 degree by manual adjustment. Still four cross spindles available. Second one is BTW3100. This was designed for customers who needed one more cross spindle. L20, L32, type 10 and 8. We utilize GSE 3210 or 3310. You can install this BTW3100 still one more cross spindle is available then you can have a total of five cross light plus thread wiring in case of type 12 uh, please use three modular v axis holder then now you can install bdw 3100 Third one is BTW5000 and 6000 on B axis. You can change uh, helix angle by B axis command in NC program. You can make a different lead or screw on the parts. Continuously changing helix angle by B axis control to make thread on taper. Here is an example. First thread wire process. Turn again. I hope you can notice angle changing while wiring process. We can do it because thread wiring on the B axis. Here is an information D25 type 8, M532 type 8, BTW6000 works. Cutting and insert suppliers. As you know, we have three suppliers set up. And here's the information. Depending on the uh, thread wiring head type, you can you should choose from uh, type A or type B. Next one is high speed spindle. As you know, one spindle can go multiple models, multiple positions. We are offering uh, four type of packages. For one spindle, 
system to four spindle systems. All spindle systems include required flange type spindles, cable, drive unit, EA unit, and integrated machine interface. This is electrical spindle. Maximum sp speed is 80,000. Correct is supplied from NSK America Corporation. Correct type is CHA. Motor power is 140 watt. Spindle speed can be changed as 1000 RPM increment. Available by B code. Depend on machine, this may be MB or M1000 in NC program. We also offered some kind of special tool block for high speed spindle. Here is a for example for K16, back cross, two back cross, front, 60 degrees or 45 degrees, 30 degrees for back or front and face. <clears throat> this is L12. Customer needed a total of six uh, cross high speed for front. We provided special block for three additional high speed spindle instead of regular ID block. Here is an example uh, for front and face. Regular ID block uh, pitch was too tight, then we provided special block to install a total of four front face high speed spindle. A20 is case. One end face, one angle. Or utilize existing ID block. We put small block. Then you can rotate to make a uh, angle for each stations. L20, L32 example. L20 type 10. You can adjust angle 90 to 45 on the back side. L32 case, we utilize regular B axis spindle. We provided special block to install three or four straight type high speed spindle. We move on another interesting option. This is a tool monitoring system. Dave Duby will explain details. Dave? Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see everybody here. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, just a note on some of the spindle systems that Mike was talking about as well. Um, a lot of those were, you know, our standard uh, 319 spindle. Um, NSK does have other spindles available um, that are uh, uh, capable of being used in our machines. As you saw on some of those tool blocks, um, th there was you saw some straight type spindles uh, that fit in some of those blocks as well. Um, they do have spindles with uh, uh, larger torque. Um, so you can do a little bit heavier cuts with some of them, maybe even some bigger tooling if necessary. Um, we do design uh, custom systems um, to accommodate other spindles as well and or uh, any type of control uh, that may be necessary to uh, operate the spindles in the way you need. So, you know, if you if you feel you have a special uh, requirement uh, for a spindle system, you know, outside the box of our standards, uh, please don't hesitate to call your uh, local distributor and, and uh, have them get a hold of us and let us know what you need and we can uh, design accordingly. So we do have um, 
some custom design systems out there that work very well with the, even different spindles altogether, the E3000 spindles, which are a much larger spindle as well. Um, so that being said, uh, if you have any special needs for a spindle system, just let us know and we can more than likely accommodate. Um, so onto the high speed spindle system tool monitoring. Um, this is an option. It doesn't come with the system, although we include it in the manual so that um, if you decide to add it on later, um, you have all the information necessary to, to operate the system. Um, the NSK tool monitoring system is designed to detect a broken tool uh, the next time the tool is used after a break. So basically, if you know when you're running along and you're making parts and all of a sudden the tool breaks, you know, you're not going to get the alarm at that point when the tool breaks. But the next time you come around to use the tool, um, that tool will not register a load in the system and therefore register a broken tool. The really nice thing about the system is it takes zero cycle time to operate. Um, <clears throat> it just um, runs on the B codes that are normally uh, used in the system, plus a, a second uh, B code to turn the system on and off. Uh, which makes it very seamless in your, in your part program. You know, these systems will help prevent making bad parts while running unattended. Uh, so that way, you know, you don't start your system just before you leave, you break a tool and come back and have, you know, a bin full of bad parts. You know, this will at least stop the machine. Um, it'll alarm the machine if you have your machines that are set up to, you know, let you know when they go into alarm, uh, then you can actually go go in or have your guy go in and uh, clean it back up, put a new tool in and, and start running again. So, you know, waste the whole night of production and, and make bad parts. Um, system will not really help prevent breaking of follow up tools depending upon uh, how you run the system. Um, it, it could potentially um, help, but it, it may not. In other words, if you have a tool that made a feature and then you got another tool going in after that, um, you potentially would break that tool. So there's different ways around that. Um, we can work with you if, you if you need to make sure that you don't want that to happen. Um, again, the system works off the load of the tool um, that it creates when it's doing the work. Uh, the load will break a uh, threshold or set point to sense a good tool. Um, there are individual set points and thresholds for each tool in your system. In other words, you know, we build systems like Mike said earlier, there was um, systems that can have up to six spindles in it um, and we can do this this tool um, uh, monitoring for each tool as an individual tool with its own set point um, that that makes it pretty diverse as far as not worrying about, you know, the load one tool will create versus the load another tool will create so. Um, it is very helpful to have those individual set points. OK, next slide. Uh, basically, when the threshold is not met, uh, a broken tool is registered. This um, depiction is is the uh, the sine wave, basically, you might say of a, an actual spindle motor um, when it runs um, and then it's at idle current and then it shows the cutting current and you see some of the abbreviations down below there. We'll get into those in a little bit, but the high point is basically your startup load. So when any motor starts up, it always draws a high amount of current um, and then it drops down to where it runs at. And then when you put the motor under load, it registers, you know, a higher current and it'll register that, you know, in a perfect world, it's pretty flat right here. But obviously in the cutting world, it, it you know, it especially if you pack or move uh, do their different things. It's going to be an up and down kind of signal, but um, it's seeable, you know, through this system to detect um, a, a tool, whether it's working or not working. OK, next slide. So um, basically um, the system works, you know, through your obviously through your part program uh, with your current codes in your in your, you know, for your spindle systems. Um, I'm just using the B code here as a as a you know, basic generic code, kind of like Band-Aid right now, the way B codes are. Um, so, um, you know, B201, which represents spindle one, you would want to start that well before you actually need it. And, and the reason being is, is what we looked at earlier there, that startup current. 
uh, on your spindle. You want to make sure you don't have that come into play uh, for your tool monitor. So that part of it um, would would actually interfere with the actual working of the way the tool monitor is set up. So basically, you'd start up by your 201, then you would set your spindle speed B150 arbitrarily uh, right now, uh, the 50,000 RPMs, and then you would move the spindle to your pre-work position, which basically, um, when you're ready to use it, you're rapid to position, and then just before you're ready to go in, you know, at your feed rate and start cutting, uh, you want to start the tool monitoring system with your B211. Uh, B211 is for drive one, B212 would be for drive two, and B uh, 213 would be for drive three. So if you have, again, multiple spindle systems um, where you have uh, more drives, you would have to set that code for that drive and for that spindle. Um, so you send the spindle in to do the work. Uh, when the work is done, when you turn off the spindle, 201 again uh, for spindle one, uh, at that time the spindle is turned off, that's when it sends the result of the monitor. So it, in the beginning, um, as you fire that B211, it takes a snapshot of the uh, idle current, and then it adds it to the offset that you've created. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, so basically, like I said, when the spindle is turned off, it sends the result. If the tool was fine and it created a load, uh, the, the program just going to continue on with you won't even know that the code ran. It, it, it just processes it and goes right through. If, in fact, the tool is broken, then the machine will actually go into alarm and stop. Next slide. OK, this is a basic setup um, on how to set the system up uh, to run. It's really very simple to do. Um, we have a, a detachable HMI pendant that goes with the system. Um, one thing to note is if you have um, a system currently in your facility uh, and you want to get uh, another spindle system with the tool monitoring, you don't necessarily have to order the HMI pendant. You can you can use the one pendant for multiple systems. You, if, you know, you, I don't think it's a good idea to keep it plugged in because when you go to use it for something else, you won't remember which system it's in. You'll, you'll be having an Easter egg hunt for the whole day trying to find your pendant. So ideally, it's a good place to keep it as in a a lead guy's desk or, or the office or something so you can always find it and then when it's time to set up a system you plug it in and, and off you go so basic description of the hmi um, is if you look at it you have the load window that displays the live load of the spindle so when the spindle is running you're going to see a live load displayed uh, in that window um, set point window is the um, window that uh, shows the set point after you created uh, the threshold and entered it into the uh, offsets there. Next slide. The offset window is where you enter your offset that you've calculated. Um, so again, there are offsets for each individual spindle. Uh, the F keys select the screens for the systems with more spindles. In other words, um, as soon as you plug this into the system, it's going to automatically know how many uh, drives you have on the system and that'll be based on the F key and the little LED in the lower lower left hand corner um, that will light up each key one two and three and so this one here is representing basically a, 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 a spindle system with one or two spindles but it only has one drive unit so if there was another drive unit with one or two spindles on it um, it would F2 key would light up and so on for the F3 key. If you had a third drive with, you know, one or two spindles on it as well, then the F3 key would be lit up and then it would each page would say drive one, drive two or drive three. That will indicate uh, you're on the right drive. Then as you can see, each spindle offset is represented by its B code so that it, it makes it easier to remember that it's not spindle one or spindle two or spindle three or spindle four. You're working with the B code in your part program, so it makes it easier to remember that, oh, okay, I'm working with B201, that's my spindle one, and that's where I need to put that offset. So um, just a little more intuitive uh, operation. Okay, next slide. 
So Dave, if you could hold for one second, we do have two questions. All right. So the first one is, um, do you still need that external box to teach tool monitoring or is it done through B codes? No, to teach the tool monitoring, you need that HMI pendant, yes. Okay, and the second question is, how is the coolant affecting this? It didn't work so good two years ago for me. There was too many false alarms because of the coolant. Yeah, that was uh, something that we found out later on and depending upon the system, uh, we did start out with a system that had basically a uh, arbitrary offset value that was in the system. Um, and again, we found that that didn't really work across the board. And um, once we came up with this adjustable threshold, uh, it has cleaned a lot of things up, but um, you do have to deal with the noise part of this, what I call noise. Um, so it's, you know, you're looking at that, um, that um, sine wave that we saw, the way the motor runs. Um, and we'll, we'll get into this part of it a little bit later here, but um, yeah, you do have to try to mitigate the noise as, as best as you can. And we do have some um, options for that. Some of them are very basic, but we do have a item that can be put over the end of the, the spindle to prevent some of the coolants from interfering with the, with the load of the spindle. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Keep yep. going. So the uh, best way to set this up is you gather the information necessary to calculate the offset. So again, we have some, some abbreviations here. So NCL equals non-cutting load, uh, CL equals cutting load, and TH equals threshold. So use the formula in the manual to calculate the offset. And below you can see the formula. CL times 0.8, which is basically, we're looking for 80% of what the cutting load is as a threshold. Um, so that when the tool goes to cut, it's gonna break that threshold and then uh, it'll register a good tool. So once you get that 80% of the threshold, um, you minus that from the non cutting load, which equals the offset. And then um, once you have that offset number, um, you plug that into the screen and we'll show you that in a minute. So in order to get that information, you really need to kind of run apart and monitor some of the loads that you're going to see for that specific spindle. And you do that with that HMI pendant. So um, as you're running your, your part program, when you get to the point where your spindle is going to start uh, and, and create and you be able to monitor the loads, at some point you may want to actually single block through because you want to kind of do a few things to determine your noise uh, if there is any. So um, when you get to the point where the spindle starts and its speed is set after that code, if you can go into single block and just let it sit there and you can monitor that live, that live load of the spindle and that would be your NCL value. So just write your NCL value down and then once you've got that and, and you're going to see that fluctuate as well on the screen a bit. It's not going to be a uh, you know, a solid line, especially if there's coolant kind of hitting the spindle for some reason or another, you're going to see that fluctuate a little bit. So I always try to pick the high side as I watch it um, and, and then use that higher number for that for that setting. Um, and then once you've got that number, you're comfortable with that number, then you can go in and just go ahead and let the, the tool start cutting. And then again, monitor that value as it's cutting and, and see where you end up on the higher side of that one. So actually really on the lower side of that one, because you want to make sure that, you know, you, you're not going to get a spike that's not there all the time. So I would take the lowest number of the cutting um, value and, and utilize that in the formula. Um, so again, once you calculate those numbers, um, you might actually want to go back and put the spindle in positions um, and turn coolant on and off and see if you get uh, varying values in that in that uh, in that number because that's how you're going to tell basically if there's noise. So um, once you gather up all your information, you create that offset number and then um, you want to go ahead and enter it into the into the system. Again, if you don't see a big difference between the non-cutting load and the cutting load, 
there could be excessive noise in the system again, which is coolant. Noises, flood or high pressure coolant hitting the collet nut of the spindle. Collet nut has flats um, on the spindle, obviously, to be able to change the tool. Um, so what happens is this system is based on the load coming out of the drive unit for the NSK, which means um, at a rough value, it's it's very coarse coming out of the drive, but when we bring it into our system, we scale it up like 10,000 times so that we can see the small tools and, and their cutting loads. So anything that influences that spindle and adds any kind of resistance to the spinning of that is going to actually represent a load. So it, it, and the, unfortunately, it doesn't know the difference between coolant and then when it's cutting. So that's why um, we have to try to prevent the noise. Uh, next slide. OK, noise mitigation is important for this system to work efficiently. There are a few options for noise mitigation, which the basic ones are, you know, take a look at your process, you know, you know, focus your your flood lines and your high pressure lines, you know, so they're not, you know, influencing the spindle in any way. Uh, sometimes it may not even be a, a line that's, um, you know, pointing maybe at your cut with the spindle, uh, but it could be another high pressure line, say hitting something and then spraying across the machine and, and hitting the collet nut. And that can actually uh, create a, a problem because you know you don't think of the stuff around it. And that's really, you know, where some of the issues come in is from, you know, uh, uh, noise coming from other, other parts of the process inside the, the cutting area. So those are just some things you got to look at. Um, basically, uh, if, if you can't focus things or move uh, coolant lines to the degree where it's going to eliminate the noise sufficiently, um, you can always, you know, either you can or we, we do, um, we have uh, shrouds that will go over the end of the spindle. It's just a 3D printed plastic uh, cone like that fits over the end of the spindle and it guards the collet nut. So it doesn't create any uh, any uh, room issues or anything, but it does prevent anything from spraying at the at the collet nut and hitting it. And that that's been pretty successful with some of our customers that we've used this with. Um, so again, once you've calculated your uh, offset uh, for the appropriate spindle, you want to enter that into the system. Next slide. Basically, press the spindle code window you are working with. So if you press the 201, um, window, you're going to get this pop up uh, keypad on the on the right. Um, so you want to do is you want to clear. The uh, value that's in there first with the CL the clear button and then go ahead and enter your your value in. So uh, go ahead and then next slide. So you key in the 500 it's an arbitrary number. Um, right now, so key in 500 and then um, you hit the enter button and you can see um, the next slide. It'll be in your offset window. So B201 now equals 500. So the new offsets in the window so is now when you run the part, um, the offset will be added to the NCL to create the set point when B211 is red. Next, next slide. So here's where we were talking about the noise um, on the, with flood coolant on potentially. You can see the blue line is the, um, the you know the motor sine wave, and then the the, the purple line is basically um, what the what the load would look like with say flood coolant maybe hitting the 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 collet nut. You know so you know you want your you know you could probably get away with that. And, you know, these numbers in that formula aren't written in stone. You can tweak that number to whatever works well. You know, the 80 percent is is really a baseline, um, but you can you can tweak it to to where you need it to be and what works best. So um, but this is a representation really of what we're trying to achieve, um, you know, when we set that threshold and set point in, in the system. Um, so like I said, it, it it pays to help mitigate it. Um, only because it makes the, the system a little more robust. But again, if you can't and you know nothing works, but usually those shrouds do, um, you can you can play with those numbers to get them as close as you possibly can. 
to where you're going to see that that threshold get broken every time a tool cuts and that's the important part so next slide oh, Ed. all right oh i'm sorry yeah so the uh, first one was flood coolant this one's the high pressure flood coolant was a little bit lower you know sometimes the high pressure can be higher um but again when you're setting up the part you know do some stuff with the coolant off and then turn the coolant on you know while it's while the non-cutting load is is um working to see if the uh, the high pressure or flood coolant influences that number and you'll see it right away um you'll see that number spike up when you turn your flood or your high pressure on you'll see that number spike up but it's uh it's a pretty pretty good system for for what it does like I said, it's it's takes zero cycle time. It's not like you got to use a, a whisker, you know. So with some of these tiny tools that we put in these spindles, sometimes the whiskers aren't the best thing to, to tap on those tiny tools with. Um, so that's why I say the, these systems here are, are work really nice for some real basic, just, you know, a tool that breaks and disappears. So there's either no load, you know, or there's, you know, the cutting load. There's nothing in between. So you know, if you got a tool that you know, geez, maybe only the cutting part of it, maybe part of the tip breaks off, um, probably not going to work well in a situation like that. You you got to really know that when your tool breaks, it disappears uh, and and it doesn't touch the part at all. Because again, if it's touching the part when it goes to cut, it's going to think it's a good tool. So um, so those are just some of the caveats that you, you have to know about the system. Again, this is not you know. Uh, a fix all for every situation, but this does fit into a lot of situations where, um, you know, where you, like I said, running unattended and, and you want to monitor that tool and, and not have to worry about cycle time and, and things like that. So, but that's pretty, pretty much it on the, on the tool monitoring system. Uh, okay. I do have one question to add. Uh, it's, it's simpler before the monitoring is, can one high speed spindle drive be used with multiple high speed spindles or how many spindles can be on a drive unit? So the NSK drive units themselves are set up with two ports for two motors, um, but on a single drive unit, you can only run one spindle on a drive unit at a time. So um, if you want to buy a system um, that, you know, you want to run two spindles at the same time, then you need to buy a system that has two drive units and two spindles. And we have um, specific part numbers for a system like that. So like I said, if if you have something other than what you saw there as a standard system, um, we do have options as well to do that. Um, the other thing that I've noticed, some people <clears throat> don't really understand the premise behind the way the codes work, turning spindles off and on. We've had people that wanted to buy spindle systems and then for a four spindle system, they think they can buy two two spindle systems and it, it doesn't work that way. That interface that that accepts the B codes, it it they're all the same. So if you put two of those systems on when you do B201, you're going to turn two spindles on at the same speed, which, you know, we, we don't want to do that normally. Um, but so that's why every in, every spindle is individual. So from B201 to B206 for a six spindle system, um, like I said, we can do six spindles with tool monitoring uh, on one system. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dave. So, yeah, I continue uh, about the tooling and accessories. Uh, box fitting saw attachment or edge side to box uh, 8 type 8 10 12 the standard cutter od is 2 inch correct size er 20 maximum of od is 13 millimeter or one, uh, half inch maximum rotation speed 3600 reductions ratio is 3 fifths both them support is provided. Actually, we we don't know. Uh, customer may want to use their own cutter. Then now we do not provide any other with spindle. 
then please give information about the color you want to use. Then we can design and offer, or we can give some critical dimensions. You can make it. They up to you. Then actually, same spin though can be installed on L20, L32, Yang2 post. Now we can use as having spindle. Maximum half cutter OD at 32 millimeter. Cutter width, width is a 26 millimeter. Maximum hex angle two degrees. It means making a spur gear. It means straight teeth. Again, both end support is provided. Same as color and uh, three things or color then please keep having colors uh, specification or dimensions we can provide um, other or you can make with our information from us Spindle used as back slitting saw. Again, same spindle is installed on the L20 SRE to Gang 2, used as having. Here is another example of a having spindle. L20 type 810, also L32 type 8 and 10. We have GSE 3310 on the T10 stations at three station modular tooling. We can provide three upper spindle with support unit using two stations. Upper OD is 8 millimeter, it means ID of hub cutter is 8. Maximum hub cutter size is 32. Maximum cutter width is 32 as well. Now you can make uh, 45 degrees angles making helical gear. Another advantage is you can approach from a uh, top or bottom. This means you can make right and left hand gear by same hub cutter, depending on the direction of approach. Next thing that a tandem end face spindle. L20, L32, type 10, type 12, as a back life to post but only one row, upper row is for the life. If you, a customer needs more life too, we can provide double. One input, then you can give two life to availability. In case of L20, ER11, L32, ER16. As you see, both of up low spindle rotates same direction. Here's a part number in case L20, L32. Next one is a stationary to some kind of special customized block. L212 type 10. As standard, we have two ID for opposite. I mean, next to sub spindle for front side. We designed four ID front ID stationary block. From face of block, to tip of two, it's almost two two inch. A 
Another one is a stationary tool for BNA42 GTY. Standard is a uh, ID block, five ID block for the back. We made a seven. Also provided three additional turning holder for the back side by Kenametal KM Micro. Another example of a stationary tool for the L12 is a deeper hole block using regular ID tool block. Uh, utilize lower two stations, putting new block, then now making 130 millimeter, 4.4 inch length drill was available. We made same uh, design for the A20, A32 before, now available on the M12. Next item is checking device. We have many requests for deduction sleep or oversized sleep. Most of the cases request is sub spindle, but we also can provide for main spindle as well. Some of our oversized conversion available, but depend on the machine. Here's just a list showing which uh, deduction sleep or oversized are a conversion kit we we have done before please contact local sales staff uh, for details for quotation then we can work together and provide quotation over grid kit do you know hard engine offering TF25 OG Colette? This will give 2.2 millimeter over grip. But we also provide over grip kit for each model. Actually, this includes two parts, making a more stroke of a check sleeve. Then we can make up to three millimeter over grip. Here's our over grip kit number. Here's some information on TF25 OG from Hardinch. Again, only by only correct, you can have 2.2. Adding our over grip kit, you can go three millimeter. Last one for our tooling accessories, rotary parts carousel. Dedicated parts can be separated, collected into individual locations, enabled to long, longer periods of unattended operation, custom operation available upon request. Now we have three types. Standalone, it's very old, original style mount on the machine with vacuum ejector. So we, I will explain about the vacuum ejector later, but uh, uh, you can drop parts to parts carousel from vacuum. Last one is when you use rot rotary parts carousel with workpiece conveyor, now we have a hinge style uh, mounting while use, use learning receiving the parts from parts piece conveyor, work piece conveyor. But uh, when you need open chip door, it's interfere, then you can swing to make uh, enough space for cutting chip door. Again, we have three types now. Then here is details part number. 
So Mike, yeah. I do have one question yeah. uh, from the earlier slide of the uh, chuck sleeves and the reduction sleeves. Mm -hmm. and, and it talked, the question says, can the guide bushing be oversized as well? OK. So then guide bush oversized, so then some of our models we are offering in the machine codes. Um, but some of them is cut should be special, but uh, we can offer on the quote if it's not in machine quotes. Yeah, so I'll add to that. It's Mike saying we actually offer it on many of our models. Um, so just work with your distributor and you can and find out which ones are offered. And to summarize the tooling and accessory section before Mike goes into automation, mm -hmm. all of those tool holders came from individuals like yourselves and dealers that had a need. So we would request for you to, if if you see some things that you, you know we don't offer and you need a special, by all means, our R and D group is here to satisfy your needs. Uh, just let us know. All of those tool holders were somebody's idea in the past, and they're now our semi-standard. But uh, if you have your own need, please let us know. And Mike, please go ahead and continue. Thank you. Okay, third, third one, the automation. Uh, actually, four items I provided. Wire ejector. Customer has problem. Uh, you have long bad parts. Then, if regular long wappies device works, it's okay. But uh, the concept of regular one is to push the previous part in the sub spindle with the next part until parts finally fall out the other end of sub spindle. This works well, however, it can be caused of jumps in the discharge tube depending on the parts profiles. In addition, this process is not allow, allowed for sharp tip on end face of the parts. Wire eject can be solution because wire ejector pushes the parts through the sub spindle collet and the discharge tube until the part is completed ejected. I show you some. This example M425 is a sub spindle. This is the part. This is the uh, brush tip, the wire. Showing inside the machine. Here's the left side of the machine. This is the discharge tube. Pushing by wire, ejecting left, left side of the machine. Movie is showing it catching by big hands, but our, our recommendation is a regular long one piece tray as a basic. Many of customers are buying uh, using wire eject and the regular long one piece tray. <coughs> Uh, we have two types of a uh, wire feeding system. Pneumatic cylinder, long, long stroke pneumatic cylinder is the original type. Pushing to feed the wire or pulling to uh, retract the wire. Then we have two sensors, front end and uh, back end. Another option is a more intelligent, smart things. It's a servo driven. Here is some uh, summary of a uh, uh, construction. Uh, we have two rollers. One roller is servo driven, connected to servo motor. So another one is idler, installed with uh, encoder. Pinch wire by idler roller with encoder and the drive rollers. Actually, sub roller is rotating to feed wire. Moving a wire will rotate another roller connected with encoder. This means we can monitor 
by encoder if your wire is moving or stuck somewhere if sub or sub drive lola is rotate but idola is not rotate rotating this means slip is happening so system can detect jamming if wire slips also we can change speed or end the position or wire depending on the application this is the video is showing how it works this is sub or roller this is either and the encoder So as the highest version of a, a wire eject, we provided a full automation tray system. Again, wire pushes the parts, the part ejected from the tube. You can install two trays on the automation system. First tray is full, then ejected full tray position, then taking new empty tray, then keep running. So this makes a longer unattended production. We provided a similar style automation for vacuum or gripper uh, unloaders so then uh, we will show you the details video later next one is the vacuum ejector many medical parts are so tiny and very difficult to eject by a regular ejector on south spindle many customers complain that parts get lost in the system we provide solution Vacuum ejector collects such parts by airstream. Strong negative air generator can catch the parts and the plastic deceleration funnel prevents part damage. Here's our example. Subspindle has very small parts. Go to eject position. Part is collected to the tube because vacuum system is behind of this wall. By this system, vacuum system, we successfully uh, collected the parts with no loss. However, because of the stream is very so fast then now next problem was the damage of the parts that's why we designed plastic funnel 3d printed plastic funnel to make a slowing down i show you some example i hope you can see parts it slowing down then drop gently to the single bin now we are offering basic type of vacuum ejector for three models m12 k16 l220 each model has a two types of vacuum system 8 mm ID tube or 19 mm ID tube depend on the pass size size means diameter or length as combination and we like we would like to see uh, example of parts you have then we can choose which one is the best for you also we provided two conversion kit 
customer may need standard eject or customer may need vacuum depending on the parts then you can you want convert uh, switch easy then by conversion kit you can change standard jet or vacuum very easy also between 8 to 19 millimeter you can choose uh you can switch easily between two options at this moment well we have time for l12 but we can uh work on the offer for other models as well Here is an example of the vacuum ejector with rotary pass carousel, as I showed before. This is the basic vacuum ejector part number. Plus, this is the pass carousel number used with vacuum. This is now in the machine codes. Uh, here is a uh, video of a flow automation. And David UB will uh, make comment while move, uh, lining the movie. So as you can see, you can pause that mic for a second um, and maybe back up to where it ejects the part again. When you, when you watch that shuttered door, that little shutter there open and close that's how fast that part travels through that system because we sense that part at the other end uh, as it enters the funnel so that we can turn off the vacuum because quite frankly if 